Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak to you this evening. Um, I'm sorry it's having to be done by Zoom and hope that the technology works so that we, you can actually hear me and uh, see the whole thing. Um, I've called this talk Uncertain Times, which is probably a fair description for most people in Ireland during the period from the outbreak of the First World War until the end of the Civil War in 1923. Against this background, I'm going to cover the experiences of the Good Body family and Clara, how they coped with the situation and how it effectively ended their dominant role over the local community. Perhaps I should start by describing the position in Clara when the war with Germany broke out. Uh, Robert Goodbody, i just get a picture of Robert Goodbody, a bit larger. He was a Quaker from Mount Mellick and came to Clara in 1825 to take up a new career as a miller at Charlestown. He and three of his sons gradually acquired the remaining mills in the locality and also expanded this activity by the acquisition of some larger mills in Limerick. In 1865, they started a jute factory at Clash of Warn. So by the time Robert's grandchildren were running things in Clara at the beginning of the 20th century, they were probably the largest employees in the county as they also had a number of businesses in Tullamore. These included a grocery shop, an agricultural supplies business, a sawmill, a special brand of chop, which was for feeding horses, and a firm of solicitors. As Quakers, they practiced a largely paternalistic approach to their employees, with whom they generally had a good relationship and looked after. Well, Sorry, did you lose me? Is that okay? Can you hear me? Michael, if you unmute, I can... You can tell me if I'm... You can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, Michael. Go ahead. Uh, yes, it, it told me to unmute. Yeah, fine. Um, That's it. Yeah. This uh, painting of Robert Goodbody was done for his 60th birthday in 1840. It's quite unusual because it was painted by a Quaker artist. And Quakers didn't, in fact, approve of paintings. And certainly not, they didn't like to have likenesses of them, themselves, which they regarded as rather vain. Um, Anyway, but I'm now going to show this um, next slide, which is Charlestown at the beginning of the century. Um, it's a fairly well-known photograph, but if I just cover the um, what's in it, it's the it's the main sort of good body milling centre. On the left is Charlestown House, the the old mill house. Then you move across, and there's the original mill which was built around about 1800. Then in front of that is the mill office which later became the courthouse, I think still stands. Then at the back is the old steam mill which was built in 1839 and which was really responsible for the good bodies uh, getting ahead of all their local competitors because they had they weren't reliant on running water. There was a great shortage of water in Clara at the time because there were three mills all vying with each other for it. Um, in front, just moving across to the right, you can just see the top of Inchmore. And then there's the old weaving factory, which um, predated the jute factory. Then we have Charlestown Bridge, um, the photograph, unfortunately, doesn't show the gas works, which was to the right of the bridge. And then there's the meeting house behind it. Um, 
Anyway, by 1914, there were no less than eight good body house sales in Clara. Uh, they occupied all the principal properties and larger houses. They'd formerly owned large amounts of land, um, as well as more in Westmeath, but most of this had been sold off after the problems with the Land League in 18, 1880s. I'm just going to put up a map of Clara. Uh, this is the 1913 map. I've uh, put in red all the various family houses. We've got Clara House, we've got Drayton Villa, Beechmount, Kilcorsey, Upton, Charlestown, and Inchmore. And in green, green is the, there's a Clash of Warren factory on the left. Then there's a mill in the middle, the old street mill in the middle of the town. Then we have um, the Charlestown mill. And I've also highlighted Avon Moor, which was a house which used to belong to, belong to Dr. Bewley, which uh, features later in the talk. If I just get rid of that one and go on to the next one. Um, anyway, many of the family had served as justice of the peace and had other civic roles. Perry Goodbody, this is a, a photograph of Perry, uh, who lived at Inchmore, was probably the most influential of the family at the time. He'd also served as High Sheriff and Deputy Lieutenant and had been a member of the County Council since it was formed in 1899. All in all, they, the family played a pretty dominant role in Clara's affairs uh, before the First World War. They probably considered themselves to be loyalists, so they supported the war with Germany although there was some dissension among the older generation who'd been brought up to abide by the Quaker aversion to taking up arms. Um, in the event, only a few of the younger men enlisted, including Barrington Goodbody, whose life is believed to have been spared at the front when a sniper's bullet ricocheted off a hip flask he had in his back pocket. So that was lucky for him. Um, Others took part in um, non-combatant roles, joining the Quaker-sponsored Friends Ambulance Brigade, as well as working as nurses and stretcher bearers. Mary's daughter, Nora, proudly recalled having been one of the first women to drive an ambulance. At, the home, at home, the women made up food parcels to be sent to Europe, and they collected sphagnum moss from the local bogs as this had special qualities, which was good for field dressings. Just give you a next photograph, which is, here's Nora with her cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth Freeman, um, dressed in their nurses' uniforms. I think this was taken in Ireland rather than abroad. Um, the, um, Anyway, despite some casualties among the wider family, none of those from Clara were killed, although Nora's husband and that of her sister Eva, um, who was Monty Russell from Moat, they lost their lives in 1916 and 1918, respectively. This, uh, this is a photograph of some women collecting sphagnum moss out on the bog. I, I, don't, I don't know which bog this is, maybe, maybe Clara bog. Uh, the situation for others in Clara was rather different. It's estimated that, that some 200 men enlisted in the British Army as volunteers following a, an active recruiting campaign. It is not known how many were killed or wounded, but thought to have been about a quarter. Although the good body supported the stance of John Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party, this was not altogether in their own interests as it left the jute factory short of workers so that parts of it had to close down. The, um, the shortage of workers was all the more problematic from 1915 when the government desperately needed sandbags uh, for the trenches. Harold Goodbody was then running the factory and he had to prevail on some of his co-directors 
who claimed they could not support the war because of their religious principles. Um, but he won the argument by pointing out that the sandbags were in fact used for saving people's lives. So the resulting order, which they then got, uh, meant that the factory was soon running flat out and it became highly profitable for them. Uh, the next slide is um, Eric Goodbody, who uh, some people may remember as he was still living in Clara in uh, the 1950s and early 60s. Um, he um, went off to the front in the Friends Ambulance Brigade and he came back and he, we found some photographs which he'd taken. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this vehicle is, but uh, it's obviously something he found at the front. And um, that's a French uh, army plane. This is in the very early days of, of, um, of uh, photography and, and airplanes, of course. Um, So the mills were operating at full capacity as well as there was a general need for home produced flour because of submarine activity. This was disrupt disrupting supplies from North America. Um, the um, milling control board, which was set up by the government actually gave very generous prices. And um, consequently the, um, the family were still doing pretty well and able to carry on their former lifestyle uh, despite shortages and a, a gradual rise in costs and wages. Uh, the um, rebellion in 1916 in Dublin really took everybody by surprise in Clara uh, because in those days there was no 24 hour news or mobile phones. People had to rely on what they read in the newspapers, telegrams and what they heard from others. The, uh, the, the first indication that something was amiss, according to Harold, was when the evening train failed to turn up at Clara Station. They then received a telegram from the County Inspector of the RIC in Tullamore, uh, Inspector Crane, as he then was, uh, saying that the General Post Office had been seized. Harold um, subsequently attempted to drive to Dublin to find out the position about his family and also their business interests up there. And uh, he left a day-to-day -day account of the two weeks following the rebellion. This was actually included in um, the appendix to 100 Years of Clara History, which uh, came out last year as, as already referred to. Uh, next slide is... Um, I mean, like most country districts, Clara was not really affected by the events in Dublin and soon life returned to normal. However, they did notice troop movements on the railways as the government thought it necessary to protect the west of the country against a German invasion. Two companies of Sherwood foresters were billeted on the old weaving factory at Charlestown and the officers stayed in some of the family houses. According to Harold, they were generally well received by the local community, um, a, a situation which was going to change later on. Uh, it, it's generally accepted, I think, that the government's handling of the rebellion was pretty inept. And afterwards, public opinion turned against them and towards Sinn Féin's drive for independence. The, the Goodbody family were worried about this as they had previously been about home rule um, because they thought it would be detrimental to their business interests. They were, however, pretty pragmatic about everything and usually steered clear of national politics. This is the um, telegram, copy of the telegram, which um, you can see is the end of the um, rebellion. And it came from Tullamore uh, to the um, Constabulary Barracks. I think that the time the, the the telephone system was pretty pretty um, crude, and telegrams also came into the factory and the mill. Uh, the 
then sort of moving on a bit, the general election of 1918 confirmed in how events were unfolding with Sinn Féin winning the majority of the Irish parliamentary seats. Despite this Perry good body, um, we saw earlier, uh, stood again as a, sorry about that, as a, um, in, in the county council elections in 1920, but he was in his late 60s and obviously failed to appreciate how things were changing. And he was roundly defeated by Sean Robbins, who was a former employee in the jute factory. Um, there was also a bit of trouble over land uh, on the somewhere near Moat, which is part of his mother's estate, and which he'd previously said he would sell off to the tenants in 1914. But because of his wife's death and um, his own ill health, he delayed doing so. So a number of farmers organized a cattle drive and they um, drove them all into the gardens at Inchmore. This is a, an old picture of an Inchmore, probably from the 1880s, but showed it as it then was. Um, Harold had to deal with this and he got the um, RIC and troops from Tullamore to come and sort it out. Uh, it all ended peacefully with the people concerned were arrested and bound over to keep the peace. And the, eventually the land was sold and divided up. The next problem for the family came three days before the armistice in 1918. When the steam mill, which was the sort of main flour milling operation, uh, caught fire early one morning, the whole building was burnt out. Uh, the, um, the beams and machinery on the top floors crashed down onto the ones below, and the flames were so intense that a line of beech trees along the side of the head race was set alight and never recovered. Nothing could be done to, to um, save the mill, although I think, gather they managed to turn off the um, steam engine or let off, let open the valve. Um, and the men working on the upper floors only escaped because they slid down a, a sack chute down to the, down to the outside. Uh, there's a picture of Charlestown and the, and the beech trees on the left there, which I don't know what there is now, but um, I think they were all destroyed. Uh, there was a rather curious aspect to the Milling Control Board's policy. Um, for the millers in that even though the mill was burnt down, MJ and L Goodbody, who ran the mills, was unaffected financially because they imported flour from Clara, from England, and they continued to be paid as if they were producing it themselves. Uh, there were, however, considerable future implications, which are not very well handled by the, the then partners. Costs had risen enormously during the war, and the insurance cover they had had in place was hadn't kept pace with it. Uh, the firm which ran the mills and their interest in Limerick was financially stretched because one of the three partners, Richard Goodbody of Clara House, had died, and they also had to buy out Fred Goodbody, who'd left Clara under a cloud because he'd taken up with the wife of the butler. At, um, Drayton Villa, his father's house in Drayton Villa. Um, the partners had also committed themselves to buying some more mills in Cork, and they had the, they paid for this with a large bank loan. Uh, despite this, the younger partners were determined to keep going in Clara, so they fitted out and modernised the nearby mill at Airy. I haven't got a photograph of I'm afraid. Um, Although this was done to the past most efficient standards of the time, they would have been better advised to have concentrated their efforts on Limerick and Cork, which were dockside mills and uh, convenient for shipping flour. Uh, so um, 1920 was when everything really got bad and political troubles started to impact on everyday life. There were numerous threats to people and 
raids on police stations around the country. Clara's turn came on the 1st of June that year when the barracks in the central square were uh, attacked at night. This has been well documented and um, written about in, in previous uh, Offaly history publications. Um, and I think despite elaborate pr preparations wasn't deemed to have been a success from the point of view of the, the rebels. From the good body's point of view, it was wake up call and a great inconvenience. The attackers broke into the building, um, broke into the um, police station from the buildings on either side, one of which was the mill, which you can, the mill which was used as a store, which is on the left. Um, it Anyway, the event created an atmosphere of fear and an indication that the IRA was gathering strength and sympathy and could make its mark. Uh, it's just a few of the few photographs from the time. Uh, this is the blocked road and uh, cars were, they made uh, wooden planks for the cars to ride across craters in, because um, the lots of bridges were blown up and roads were blocked by fallen trees. The railways was, were in strike and the telephone lines were cut. Um, but this was really a, a game of cat and mouse for as soon as they were repaired, they, um, they were promptly cut again. Uh, not long after that, the, um, sorry, there's another photograph of some ladies in a car. Um, the courthouse was burnt out in Church Street later in the year. Uh, I think one of the um, generally accepted, one of the worst decisions the British government made was to create the Black and Tans, the uh, paramilitary force his role was to help the RIC maintain law and order. In many ways, they created the opposite position uh, due to the tendency for driving around the countryside and indiscriminately shooting innocent people and burning houses. Uh, Bunny Goodbody, who was Harold's nephew, left an account of his first experience of the Black and Towns in Clara. Then age seven and living at Woodfield, which was a few miles out of the town. He used to ride his pony into Clara. There he is on his pony. Um, accompanying his father's chauffeur when they went to get graces from the Glens and meat from Sam Klein, the butcher. And um, they probably went in once a week. On this occasion, they were riding home, re sorry, returning home down River Street when they heard the roar of lorries coming into the town from the direction of Tullamore. Taking shelter in a small lane off the street, they watched as two crossly tenders laden with black and tans drove past in a cloud of dust. Shortly afterwards, they heard a couple of shots as the lorries drove off in the direction of Tullamore. And um, when things were quiet again, they walked out into the street where they saw a sheepdog which used to have a habit of running alongside and barking at passing cars lying dead in the road. On this occasion, he made a fatal misjudgment. Harold was so concerned about the state of things that he refused to send in his tax return. He wrote to the tax authorities in London saying if the government was unable to protect their subjects, then they shouldn't be demanding tax from them. As it was at the time, Sinn Féin was keeping an unofficial form of law and order through the Doyle courts and appointing their own judges. One of them was Frank Gergen, who, who worked in the jute factory at Clash and Warren. Here's a picture of, picture of Harold. Uh, much of what, what I'm going to say now is based on what Harold wrote in his later years. Apart from his time at school and university, he lived in Clara all his life and played a major part in running the uh, jute factory and other family businesses. Outwardly, at any rate, he was fairly unemotional and not, too, not afraid to take difficult decisions. 
In fact, he was the one who, when the milling business got into trouble in 1930, had the awkward job of sashing some of his cousins who weren't really pulling their weight and who ranks didn't want to take on. Um, and the ultimate success and survival of the Duke factor was probably down to him. Anyway, his, his record of what happened is probably factual and to the point, and I think can be relied on, although he saw events from the point of view of a businessman, a property owner. He had a poor opinion of politicians both British and those who followed independence. And he thought they made some very bad decisions. Uh, we're coming on now to a bit more road damage. Uh, the following year was much, not much better than 1920 and disruptions to everyday life continued. Uh, men who'd served in the British army during the war were especially vulnerable and um, as they found that their former comrades were now fighting their own countrymen, often causing great difficulties within their own families and friends. And any credit for having fought on the winning side in the war was rapidly diminishing. In, in um, February 1921, two of the chauffeurs who had been former soldiers and now worked at Inchmore and Clara House and um, in Harold's view, incorrectly, they were believed to have given information to the authorities about some men in Clara who had been arrested in connection with a shooting in Dublin. For their own safety, it was thought best they should leave England, which they did without delay. Uh, possibly connected with this incident, um, Helen Goodbody, who lived at Clara House, received a threatening letter, which is typical of the time, one of the few received by the family which has survived and is now held in the Quaker Library in Dublin, who've kindly allowed me to reproduce it. Yeah. Sorry, there's some um, more aunts standing in the crater. Uh, this is the letter, which I think you can see fairly clearly. Um, but if not, it says, We hereby caution you not to hold any conversation with the enemies of our country, the English police force. We will have no nonsense in this matter and trust you will realize same. Any gratuities you wish to make, make them to the poor of the town, not to English, England's bloodhounds. Signed IRA and addressed to Miss Helen Goodbody. Um, whether she took any notice of the threat is not known but she was one of the generation of women who weren't easily intimidated. Um, it may be that she'd been con in contact with the local police or giving them food or something, I don't know. Um, anyway, in, in um, June 1921, Harold records that the military took over in Avon Moor, which is the next slide. And you can see there it's... Uh, or fairly well surrounded by barbed wire. Uh, Mrs. Poff, who was the widow of a former bookkeeper in the mill, was living there with her family at the time and had to be found all tent of accommodation in a hurry. It is likely that this was the occasion described by Catherine Williamson in a, her semi-autobiography, which was called Come Along With Me. Uh, Catherine was the daughter of Lewis Goodbody, who was a solicitor who lived at Drayton Villa, a bit further up the road from Avon Moor. She wrote a number of accounts of her childhood in Clara and also described how she accompanied her grandmother in Dublin when she was working among the impoverished Jewish community, who were then being ignored the, by the government and largely destitute. This experience affected Catherine's views on the enormous gulf dividing her own class and the bulk of the population. And in later life, she stood as a candidate for the Labour Party in England. Um, after she married in early 1920s, she went to live in Canterbury where she twice served as mayor, the first woman to have done so. 
There she is in, the, in what her mayor's regalia. Uh, she records in, in this book that the army was intending to occupy her family's home, Drayton Villa, but was dissuaded from doing so. And the good bodies let them have Mrs. Poff's house instead, um, or finding her alternative, somewhere alternative to live. As it was, the army officers were billeted on the family at Drayton Villa, giving her parents many anxious moments, especially as the English officers were inclined to make injudicious comments about the political situation in front of the maids who work in the, worked in the house. Some were thought to have divided loyalties, and in fact, the head gardener was a prominent IRA official at the time in, in his own spare time. Uh, picture here of Lewis uh, Goodbody, who was a solicitor in Tullamore. This is a photograph um, uh, which Michael has let me show, um, taken at Rath Robin. Uh, Catherine says that her family lived in constant state of fear since her father was a partner in the Tullamore firm of A&L Goodbody who acted as agent for some of the local landowners, including Lord Digby of Gaishal. As such, he could easily have been a target for assassination. And his wife was very worried about his habit of standing in the windows to pull up the shutters at night, as it exposed him to regular danger. Um, such, as, such was her fear for his life that she decided to do the shutters herself. And Catherine thought that this, the effect of living through this period affected her mother's health and eventually uh, shortened her life. This is a um, document which was produced by a &L Goodbody of Tullamore for the um, clients, I think. Anyway, it shows the general quarter sessions dates for 1921. And bear in mind, this was the time when the Doyle courts were also operating. It also gives down the bottom costs of civil bills and costs of ejectment for non-payment of rent. Uh, there's quite a lot of detail on it, which is quite interesting from a legal point of view. Um, as it was, the um, soldiers in Avon Moor were often trigger happy, and they used to let off rounds of machine gun bullets down the street. Richard Goodbody and his wife, Helen, and three young children were living nearly opposite at Upton and were highly alarmed by these incidents. Uh, Richard went over to um, remonstrate with the soldiers who were sent back with a flea in his ear. Uh, his, his wife, Helen, not to be confused with the other Helen who received the threatening letter, um, was not prepared to put up with this and took it upon herself to go across and argue with them, eventually exacting a promise that they would only fire if they were under the fire themselves. But uh, if this wasn't enough to cope with, they also had to, the family also had to live in constant fear that Upton would be occupied by the IRA and use it a, used as a base for attacking, attacking the um, house opposite. This is a, an armored car at Charlestown. Um, I'm not sure who the children are, but they seem to be enjoying themselves. Uh, then we move on to July, 1921, when Harold says that uh, jute supplies at the factory were exhausted and the works had to be shut down for a time. There were no trains and even the use of bicycles were banned. The um, family later learned that Tom Fleming, who, was, who drove the uh, Mill commercial traveler's car, was also in charge of IRA activities in Clara district. And on occasions he used to cycle to Limerick for meetings after dark, returning to his normal work the following morning. Um, his employers having no idea of his nocturnal activities. After the truce, 
the factory got going again. The trade was very slow and wages had risen sharply. I think they went up about four times since the start of the war, World War. There was still a strong element of fear for the future. And although the treaty was signed in December, many of the former landed families sailed up and went to England. Uh, the Goodbody family, however, with their extensive industrial interests, they were far too heavily committed to the locality. And such a course would have been a financial disaster in view of what they'd just spent on area mill. Also, any decision to abandon their employees and the people dependent on them for work was not the way Quakers were used to doing things, and such a move would not have sat easily on their conscience. They were right to be apprehensive about the following year as the country then became embroiled in the Civil War. Although they would have been natural supporters of the elected government, they had to be careful not to be drawn into the conflict by appearing to take sides. And they managed to do this, although there were some worrying incidents. Uh, on one occasion, Harold discovered that the machine shop in the factory was being used for making bombs and uh, rather courageously and possibly a bit foolhardy, he told them they should be ashamed of themselves for fighting their fellow countrymen. He says that they left soon afterwards. Later in the summer, he was still arguing with the authorities about his outstanding tax return, and he sent them newspaper cutting about a couple of local house burnings which had recently taken place, probably Brookfield, Durrow Abbey, Rathroban and Scraggan. Um, and he said he saw no reason why in the circumstances he should pay his tax. And whether they ever got it is not known. There's, there's no record of that. Um, well, there's probably a, probably a note somewhere in the archives of the Inland Revenue. Uh, far more serious, however, was what was happening at Woodfield, uh, where his brother, Reginald, um, was living at, uh, just outside Clara and going into the mill every day to work. Uh, Reggie, as he was generally known, was married with an English wife and a young family. He was getting constant threats, written and verbal, and trees were frequently felled across the road leading from the house. Uh, Woodfield, which he'd taken on a long lease from the Fuller family, when he married in 1910, had a small farm attached. And it's possible that these threats were part of the prevailing uh, campaign to get the ha house emptied so that the land could be divided. However, the, there was also a more sinister reason which related to an incident that had happened the previous year when British forces were still in control, or supposedly. Uh, a section of the IRA had set up a local base in dugouts in the woods behind the house, which it also appears they were receiving food from one of the maids who was friendly with one of them. Um, the family were naturally unaware of this and were probably careless in what they said in front of, in front of the maids, and it was all reported back. Uh, here's a picture of what was left of Woodfield Bridge. Um, on one occasion, when two of the children were playing in the hayloft at the back of the house, they came across a young man asleep uh, in uniform. He was friendly towards them and allowed them to handle his revolver, although he had removed the bullets first. Uh, he swore them to secret secrecy, but Margaret, who was the eldest and aged 10, had a strong sense of responsibility and was unable to keep the secret to herself. Um, she told her parents about it later in the day. Uh, Bunny was her younger brother, and he says he was furious with her for breaking their promise and went back to warn the man, but he'd, he'd by then disappeared. Uh, not long after this, they were woken one morning with a commotion outside and found the house was surrounded by police and troops who had come across the country from Tullamore overnight. They searched the farm buildings in the woods behind and found nothing except the empty dugouts 
the, the occupants having been tipped off and left well before they arrived. Whether or not it was the case, the IRA obviously believed that the family had told the authorities about the man in the hayloft and decided to make life very difficult for them. The avenue to the house was blocked by fallen trees and on one occasion, on one occasion Reggie's motor car was stolen. Uh, there's a picture of Reggie and, and Margaret, a little bit older than 10, I think she's probably about 12 at that stage. And they're on holiday in England here. Um, anyway, Reggie then organized a working party, of men from the mill to come and clear the trees. Um, but the IRA got wind of this and the night before it was due to happen, he was handed a note by one of the maids which said, get trees removed tomorrow and your time is up as Woodfield. And left in peace, you only cause trouble. Uh, this was quoted in the Offaly Independent in May 1925. And it added rather ominously that we know who brought the tans to Woodfield. At the same time, a number of shots were fired outside uh, just to give them something further to worry about. In evidence to the claims court in Tullamore in 1925, he said that all this terrified his wife and family, and they decided that they couldn't stay there and had to leave. Harold Goodbody recorded later that detailed plans were made in secret to get the family out of the house as soon as possible. And this took place on the 9th of October. It says a lot for how the evacuation was organized that they were able to achieve it without anyone knowing in advance. Uh, without any warning, the maids were paid, told to pack their belongings and driven to the moat where they were put on a train to Dublin to be put up in one of the good body houses there. I can't believe they would have agreed to do that today. Uh, Reggie and his wife and three youngest children who were at home at the time, moved into Kilcorsey, Harold's house and Clara. And vans came down from Dublin to remove the furniture and house contents. These and the farm livestock were all taken into Clara and stored in one of the mill buildings. Uh, that night the house was broken into and many of the fittings stolen. The uh, following day, more workmen came out from Clara and they removed whatever they could salvage because they knew the rest would be looted. This included things like the kitchen range, the fire grates, the mantelpieces, bars, sinks and lavatories. They even dug up the vegetables in the garden and took the manure as they were determined to leave as little as possible. Uh, soon after, the local parish priest, Father Bracken, publicly denounced the people who had forced the family to move. Reggie and his family, which included a two-month-old baby, uh, stayed at Kilcorsey for about a month, but still felt threatened and in danger, especially after an incident when they were woken at four in the morning by someone hammering on the front door, demanding to be let in. Harold refused and eventually frightened them off by firing some shots over their heads from an upstairs window. Uh, Realising the situation was getting out of control, the good bodies decided that the only course was to threaten to close the jute factory in the hopes that the workers would put pressure on the IRA to stop the intimidation out of fear of losing their own jobs. The threat worked and from then on they had relatively little trouble although Reggie felt it sensible to move to Dublin and even spent some time in North Wales as, as he was threatened again in Black Rock. Um, after the Civil War ended in 1923, he returned to Clara, moving into Inchmore, which had been left to him by his father. And they lived there until he died of tuberculosis 10 years later. Uh, in December, 1922, Harold's brother, Jim, who ran the family mills in Limerick, was nominated as a member of the first Senate by President Cosgrave. Um, 
Unfortunately for the family, the public announcement included his full name, which was James Perry Goodbody, which is also the name of his father who lived in Inchmore. Um, they were very worried about this because all the members of the Senate were assassination targets. And the Irish Times was asked to make it clear that the nominee was James Perry Goodbody Jr. Business continued to be very bad during 1923, which wasn't helped by a strike for, of Irish mill workers, uh, where they, the employees tried, employers tried to reduce their wages, which had risen fourfold since before the war. They were finding um, it very difficult to make a profit. And uh, this unfortunately allowed the larger English firms, ranks and spillers to get a toe held in the Irish market. And they were then able to undercut prices of the local firms, many of whom, the, including the good bodies, were forced out of business. Uh, Perry, Perry Goodbody died in April 1923. Um, there's a few more photographs. Um, the jute factory also suffered a strike in 1923 and wasn't doing at all well, but was able to keep going because they built up large reserves during the war years. And under Harold's management, it survived and went on to be one of the country's leading industrial concerns uh, until the 1960s. And, uh, Reggie claimed compensation for damage to Woodfield and Tullamore County Court in May 1925, and was awarded £735 by Judge Wakeley. Uh, during the proceedings, he said that some of the maids had been in sympathy with the men in the woods, and in a response which I cannot imagine he would have got away with today, the judge asked if they were good looking. As Reggie was liable under the lease agreement with the uh, people he let, uh, rented the house Woodfield from, he also claimed against the British government through the Irish Grants Committee in London. This claim dragged on for years and was eventually settled in 1929 at a greatly reduced price. These are just a few photographs of a train crash near Streamstone, um, which is a fairly regular feature at the time. Um, so con to conclude, I really ought to stress this account of events in Clara is mainly taken from the writings of members of the good body family. And it's only one version of events and it's from their own perspective. It was, it was undoubtedly a very disturbing and difficult time for them but not untypical of what was happening elsewhere in rural Ireland. They suffered some loss of property, but no bodily injury or fatalities. And I think best of all, they retained their Irish nationality and were gradually absorbed into the newly independent state. Thank you.